When the next generation gravitational wave detector LISA, or the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, launches into space, it will unlock a whole new range of physics that we can study. It will let us observe ripples in spacetime caused by the mergers of supermassive black holes, white dwarf stars orbiting each other, and possibly even gravitational waves originating from the Big Bang. Admittedly, LISA isn't scheduled to launch until about 2034, but when it does, its engineering and scientific aims are frankly incredible. While the current gravitational wave detectors on Earth are sort of L-shaped designs, where each arm is three or four kilometers long, LISA will be a bit different. It will be a triangular design, and the side length of each side of the triangle will be about two and a half million kilometers long, which is quite the increase and one reason why LISA needs to go to space. This doesn't mean that LISA is objectively better than those smaller ground-based detectors such as LIGO, but it does mean that LISA will be able to see a completely different set of objects and events to LIGO, meaning that we can use it to study the universe in new ways. Like all waves, gravitational waves each have a different frequency that they oscillate with, and the size of your gravitational wave detector dictates the frequency of gravitational waves that you can detect. Different types of events in the universe cause gravitational waves with different frequencies, and that's why LISA will be able to study different types of objects to LIGO. The larger your detector is, the lower frequency of gravitational waves you can see with it. So LISA will see much, much lower frequencies of waves than LIGO can. I won't go into the details of how these thermometers exactly work. There are lots of videos online that already do that. But basically, they measure the differences in the length of the arms caused by the stretching of space due to gravitational waves. Remember that these differences it measures are absolutely tiny. Often, LIGO is measuring deviations in length that are smaller than the width of an atomic nucleus. LISA will be similarly sensitive, albeit to different frequencies, and will also be able to localize on the sky where a source came from better than LIGO, because LISA is basically just two LIGOs stuck together in a triangular shape. LIGO is sensitive to gravitational waves of roughly the same frequency that human ears can hear, plus a little bit extra, which means that it can see waves with frequencies between about 10 hertz and a few thousand hertz. Whereas LISA will be sensitive to gravitational waves with frequencies between 0.001 hertz and about one hertz. This means that the waves that LISA will see will have a much longer wavelength and will therefore correspond to either much heavier objects or to objects in much wider orbits than those that LIGO can see. Let's start by talking about what the current ground-based detectors, namely LIGO and Virgo, can detect. The easiest events for these detectors to see is merging black holes, where each black hole has a mass of up to a few hundred times the mass of our sun. For these mergers, we can only see the final second or so, and the so-called ring down, as the new, larger black hole settles down as a single object. These detectors can also see gravitational waves from the mergers of two neutron stars, which are very dense objects teetering on the edge of becoming a black hole, and they tend to be between about one and three times the mass of the sun. Since neutron stars are a fair bit less massive than black holes, the grav waves that they produce as they move through space are much weaker. So detecting mergers involving neutron stars is much harder, and typically we need them to be far closer to Earth for us to see them than we do for merging black holes with tens of solar masses. For a binary neutron star merger, the signal we can detect is much, much longer than that of a black hole merger, often a couple of minutes long. But one caveat is that the actual merger often goes out of the frequency range that ground-based detectors can see, and so we miss the final few seconds of the merger. It's these final moments that tell us about the object that the merger creates. So beyond an educated guess, we can't say for certain whether the final object is a large neutron star or if it collapses to form a black hole. These detectors can also see mixed mergers between a black hole and a neutron star, but again, we need these to be closer to us than a binary black hole merger in order for us to see them. In the future, more sensitive ground-based detectors are likely to see a few more types of events too. Of course, they would see more mergers involving neutron stars and black holes that are up to a few hundred solar masses, and they'll be able to see them from a lot further away. But there are two other potential sources of gravitational waves that I think are super interesting too. The first is a single neutron star, spinning alone in space. Neutron stars tend to spin incredibly quickly, and hence if they have some sort of imperfection, some kind of mountain on their surface, then this spinning can emit gravitational waves. Perhaps mountain is a bit of a grand term actually, because due to the extreme gravity of a neutron star, the highest such a mountain could be is just a few centimeters. The other possible source that future ground-based detectors might see is supernova explosions, which would be incredibly exciting. Supernovae are the deaths of massive stars who have run out of fuel, decided to give up, 
and they end their stellar lives in a massive explosion. It's possible that a sensitive enough ground-based detector would see these supernova if they were close enough. And by that, I mean they would probably have to be in our galaxy. But these explosions are expected to produce grav waves that are in the range of frequencies that LIGO can see. What's super exciting about this is that it could actually lead to our first ever triple messenger observation of an event. We could see the supernova with gravitational waves. If it was in the galaxy, we would easily be able to see it with optical telescopes as well, or even with the naked eye. And we'd also expect to see a lot of neutrinos being produced. So all of this would be amazing. Now that all that's covered, let's talk about what LISA will be able to see that no matter how sensitive a ground-based detector is, they will simply never see as they're in a completely different frequency range. LISA will be made up of three spacecraft, which will fly in an equilateral triangle formation and it will have lasers connecting the spacecraft measuring incredibly precisely the distance between each corner at all times. LISA will be in an orbit around the sun that's similar to the Earth, but it will trail the Earth by a few tens of millions of miles. Any passing gravitational wave will change the distance between each of the spacecraft, and we use this as the detection method. Again, the amount that a gravitational wave will actually change the side length of the triangle is extremely tiny. For example, LISA will have to have the precision to be able to detect relative shifts in the position of the spacecraft that are less than the diameter of a helium nucleus over the distance of a million miles, which requires some mind-bending precision. As I said, the long arms of LISA let us detect gravitational waves with very low frequencies, or equivalently very long wavelengths, so long that the wavelength of the waves can actually be larger than the entire Earth. LISA won't see the final stages of the relatively light binary black hole mergers that LIGO can see, but it will see black holes of those masses as they orbit each other. Binary orbits that LISA can see will be black holes on their way to a merger, so it's a decaying in spiral. And weeks, months, or even years later, these black holes will merge and LIGO will then be able to detect them. In fact, we'll be able to use the LISA data to very accurately predict the time and date that the final merger will happen, and then look for those same mergers in the LIGO data. This will be a very cool test that we understand general relativity as well as we think we do, and it means we'll see a lot more of the mergers, as we'll get loads of data when the in-spiral is in the LISA range, and then we'll see the final merger with LIGO. The difficulty is likely to be that LIGO will be so sensitive that it will be seeing many mergers per day by the 2030s. So we'll have to work out which merger on a given day is the one that Lisa saw years earlier. We also expect to see the early stages of binary neutron stars too, although because they're so much lighter and hence produce much weaker gravitational waves, seeing these individual binaries with Lisa will be quite the challenge still. While Lisa won't see the mergers of LIGO mass black holes, it will see the final mergers of other much heavier black holes, so-called supermassive black holes. These have masses that are millions to billions of times the mass of our sun and it means they're physically much larger than the black holes that LIGO can see. This in turn means that they merge while they're still producing very long wavelength gravitational waves that LISA can see, but the merger happens before the event ever produces waves that LIGO could see. This will provide us with a really unique window into cosmic history, and it will let us learn things about the growth of structure. It seems that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center, so the mergers of these black holes is likely to correlate with galaxy mergers, and we should be able to learn about the space-time around growing structure. LISA will also be sensitive to events called extreme mass ratio in spirals. By this, I mean black hole mergers where one of the black holes is way more massive than the other. Usually, the more massive one is at least 10,000 times more massive than the lighter one. Extreme mass ratio in spirals are less two black holes merging and more one black hole falling into a much larger black hole. And they're interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is that the graph waves emitted in this sort of event are way harder to predict and model than those from a standard merger. So it's harder to look for their signals in the data. But more difficult means more fun though, right? The second cool thing is that if we do find the signal of one of these in spirals, the exact waveform we see will allow us to probe the geometry of space-time around the black holes, and we should learn about gravity in the very strong limit here. The next type of event that LISA will be able to see is binary white dwarf stars orbiting each other in our galaxy. White dwarfs are the final stages of stars that have burnt out and died, but weren't massive enough to form neutron stars or black holes. This means that while white dwarfs are very dense objects, they are less dense than those other objects, and they're therefore bigger than black holes and neutron stars. Two white dwarfs orbiting each other are massive enough and dense enough to emit detectable gravitational waves, although these waves are too long a wavelength to be seen by LIGO. The white dwarfs are basically just too puffy, and they touch and merge before LIGO can ever see them. 
However, Lisa can see these longer wavelengths, and so binary white dwarfs should be detectable by Lisa. We also know of a few binary white dwarfs and where they are in the sky, since we've seen them with traditional telescopes. So we can actually use these known signals to test that Lisa is actually working properly once it's launched. If we see gravitational waves of the right frequency coming from the right place on the sky, we'll know that we've seen the continuous white dwarf signals, and we can confirm that Lisa is doing the right stuff. The final type of signal that Lisa is expected to see is something called a gravitational wave background, which is just a cacophony of gravitational wave signals that can't be separated out into individual sources. This is because the signals making up the background are too faint and too quiet to have been detected on their own. But when there's a whole load of them together, we can see them as a gravitational wave background source coming from all over the sky kind of like the cosmic microwave background. This won't include the loud signals like the ones we've talked about so far in this video, but it might include new and exciting sources like cosmological inflation, cosmic strings, or so-called first order phase transitions related to spontaneous symmetry breaking in the early universe. Those are likely all speculative sources at this point, but if we ever saw them, it would be absolutely amazing. Of course, all of the things we've discussed here are only the signals we know of and will be looking for, but there is also the chance of brand new physics and different types of signals that we haven't predicted yet. This could be known objects producing other types of signals or totally new physics that we just don't know anything about yet. So it's a very exciting time ahead and the possibilities for new exotic physics makes it even more exciting. If you enjoyed all this, please hit that subscribe button below and I hope to see you in another video. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.